We're going to be talking in this panel about post-mud. Um, and as we uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Chris Coates, who's here, the chief of the voting section of the Civil Rights Division. Chris, could you just? And how many, how many other members of the DOJ are here? And other uh, people who work for the DOJ. Let's get a show of hands. So we've we've got quite a reunion going on here. And actually, there's lots of people here who used to work at the DOJ. Some of them on the panel, at least one, two. Two, yeah. So uh, this is kind of fun to see the uh, the reunion going on. You, you, I take it you all don't get together that much. We don't do these things uh, more often. <laughs> okay, uh, people in the back, could you have a seat, if you don't mind? Thank you. So in this next panel, um, we're going to continue the conversation that we began in the first panel um, and also – you know, sort of look forward uh, into the 21st century, what type of democracy do we want to look like in 2020, in 2030, in 2050? What do we need to do to make sure that we achieve our goals? Um, one of the, what I've been sort of thinking about it in, in a certain way is if we were to design the Voting Rights Act today, if we were to write it today instead of writing it in the 1960s, in the middle of a, when our country was actually quite different and the political climate was quite different. But if we were to write the Voting Rights Act today, what would we do, knowing the types of problems that exist today, um, knowing the, ver the very good things that the Voting Rights Act has done, and also the, the, the other parts of our country and the issues that are left out of the Voting Rights Act that are crying out to be addressed? What, what, what would we do today differently if we were to to do that. So these are sort of some things that we're going to just think out loud about during this panel. And um, we're going to have the panelists each talk for about five to seven minutes. And then we want to bring you into the conversation and really have a good back and forth as we sort of discuss this. So uh, the first panelist um, will be Merna Perez, who uh, she's the Brennan Center's Council on Democracy. And Ms. Perez works on a variety of voting rights related issues, including the Brennan Center's efforts to restore the vote to people with felony convictions. Another graduate from Columbia Law School. Uh, obviously, a lot of great people have come out of Columbia. She clerked for the Honorable Anita Brody of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and for the Honorable Julio, Julio Fuentes of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Uh, Mirna brings a great deal of experience and brilliance to this to this topic, and we're really delighted to have her here to give us her thoughts on what happens from here. So, Mirna, thank you. Would you like to talk from here? Or? I'm fine here. Okay, thank very you. good. Thank you. Bienvenidos. Welcome. I'm Mirna Perez. I am an attorney at the Brennan Center for Justice. Um, I first want to thank Fair Vote and the New America Foundation, as well as my uh, panelists, for what was a really exciting and interesting and very thoughtful and, and thought-provoking conversation this morning. And I'm grateful for the panelists on uh, this panel, because I know that that same sort of uh, brilliance and insight is going to continue uh, um, in the next hour or so. Um, one of the things that happened with the media is that they turned the mud case into a do we need the Voting Rights Act, do we not need the Voting Rights Act, when actually the case was about what Congress can do. Um, and you know, my answer to that is Congress can do quite a lot. Um, it's got lots of powers available to it. It's certainly got the 14th Amendment. It's got the 15th Amendment, and that was something that the Brennan Center focused on in our amicus before the three-judge panel and in the form of an amicus uh, focusing on the legislative history of the 15th Amendment. Um, we made a similar argument in the Supreme Court. Um, the broad and expansive powers available to Congress um, under the 15th Amendment give, con give Congress a lot of room to do things like the voting Rights Act. Um, as we all heard this morning, however, uh, the court signaled perhaps a narrower view of what Congress can do. Um, with all due respect to the court, I think that it was incorrect. But even if uh, future decisions conform to that sort of narrow understanding, uh, like Reverend Hale said, there's a lot of star power uh, working on this issue. There's a lot of brain power in this room and outside of this room that can certainly work with Congress and work with the legislature to make the necessary tweaks to make the Voting Rights Act uh, viable and robust and uh, continue to be uh, one of the most important and effective tools that uh, the community has to try and promote and protect voting rights, especially for those that have been uh, disenfranchised both structurally and uh, due to uh, practices. Um, 
One thing, though, that I would like to uh, talk about, though, building on some of Kristen's comments, which is, is the fact that that is not the only power available to Congress. The Voting Rights Act, especially the preclearance provisions, were very carefully crafted. They were very carefully crafted to serve a very important purpose under a certain constitutional structure. Um, but Congress also has the Elections Clause. And uh, there's a lot of things that Congress can do in that respect, which will complement the work that is done by the Voting Rights Act by also protecting and promoting and preserving uh, the rights of the voting rights of persons who um, the Voting Rights Act is concerned about communities of color um, and while not directly uh, the sort of relation that uh, communities of color have with uh, people that uh, are less uh, financially able and and those sorts of uh, uh, characteristics and. There are two particular reforms that I think we can look at, which will go to promote fair representation in a in a post namudno world. Um, and I'm very grateful that one of my uh, of panel or one of the panelists beforehand teed up those issues. The first I want to talk about is the Democracy Restoration Act. Um, we heard about it briefly beforehand, but what the Democracy Restoration Act does is that it restores representation in federal elections to people who are out of prison and living in the community who had lost their right to vote because of a state disenfranchisement law. Um, you know, uh, uh, Senator Raskin uh, alluded to this, but the magnitude of this problem cannot be underestimated. There are four million people living and working in the community that cannot vote because they have a criminal conviction in their past. And the problem is exacerbated because the state laws vary. We have a patchwork of, of, of laws, and this patchwork makes it almost makes it extraordinarily difficult for people to know, you know, what rules apply to them, and you have people being disenfranchised that actually shouldn't be disenfranchised for law because things aren't clear. You have states like Maine and Vermont where you never lose your right to vote. You can vote even from prison. And you have states like Kentucky and Virginia where it doesn't matter how long ago the crime you committed. It doesn't matter how old you were. It doesn't matter what it was. If it was a felony, it's a wrap. Your right to vote is lost unless the government specifically pardons you. Um, these laws have a disproportionate and dramatic effect on people of color. Nationwide, we can expect that about 8% of the African American population, that's 2 million people, um, are disenfranchised. And if the current rates of incarceration continue, we can expect that 3 out of 10 of the next generation of African American men will lose their right to vote at some point in their life. That, that figure is astonishing, so I want to repeat it again. 3 out of 10 of the next generation of African American men uh, will lose their right to vote at some point in their life if current rates of incarceration continue. So what does the Democracy Restoration Act do? Well, it restores voting rights to persons once they are uh, free of incarceration. Um, it's a bright line rule so that people know, uh, you know when they can vote. If you are out in, the vote, uh, out in the community and physically capable of getting to a polling location, then you are eligible to vote for a federal election. And it uh, serves to sort of suggest the, uh, to promote sort of rehabilitative goals, right? If you have uh, a person that the criminal justice system has made the decision that you are safe enough to have living and working among the rest of us, then you are a person that should have a voice in the democracy and in the rules that govern you. Um, the, this would mean that people on probation and parole can vote. Um, it also requires correctional facilities to advise individuals in writing when their rights to vote are restored, which again helps um, sort of promote people understanding what the policies are and promotes uh, people being able to take advantage of those policies and not being disenfranchised because some state law, state election official doesn't know exactly what the rule is. Um, this uh, this uh, reform would address past and continuing discrimination. There's no question, I think, that uh, these state laws disenfranchising persons with criminal convictions have a history in, their gym, in, a, in our very shameful past in the Jim Crow era, and um, they were intended in many ways to block minorities from voting. And one thing that people don't think about is the ripple effect that these laws have beyond the person that's affected. Um, when people have, when there are these state disenfranchisement laws, it doesn't just affect a person, it affects the community. Um, it affects the community in two ways. One is that it strips the community of the ability to translate their numerical strength into political influence. The second is the fact that it deprives the community of role models who can model voting. There's lots of really good literature out there that suggests what we all know to be true, which is people learn to vote by watching other people around them. Kids are taken into voting uh, booths with their parents. People see their parents taking time off of work to go to the trouble of standing in line. And when you don't have people modeling that behavior, you have entire generations of children growing up 
not focusing and emphasizing on voting. So I hope when Congress reconvenes that this is one of the reforms that they, uh, that they will consider. Um, the second thing I'd like to uh, discuss is that uh, which is called voter registration modernization. It's something that uh, a number of the groups uh, involved in this panel are working on. But it's basically a way to have states automatically or, aff or affirmatively register all eligible voters. Um, why do we need to do this? Well, the existing registration system functions as a barrier. In fact, there's a broad consensus that it's probably the greatest barrier to voting. Um, a number of uh, voter protection hotlines reported that voter registration issues were the top issue that was reported to them as a problem and that was standing between a person and the ballot box. Um, it's thought to be the number one reason why provisional ballots are cast and, and why they're not counted. Um, and, you know, there have been statistics indicating that between 50 and 65 million eligible Americans are not registered to vote. Um, again, uh, because it's a state law problem or state law issue, we have a patchwork of state rules. And um, this patchwork of state rules is hampered by a patchwork of state problems. So you have, uh, you know, in Florida and Louisiana, these no match, no vote laws are compounding the registration problem. In states like, you know, uh, Colorado, you have illegal purges compounding the registration problem. You have, you know, in states like Montana, voter challenges by political operatives compounding the registration problem. Um, you know, in states like Ohio, you have issues of technicalities, um, you know, preventing registration applications. And if everybody in the country was registered to vote, or I'm sorry, if every citizen was registered to vote that was eligible, then a lot of these problems would go away. Um, I, I'd like to point out in terms of context that most modern democracies do not put the brunt or uh, the burden or the onus on the voter to register to vote. The government actually takes a proactive role. And there's a great deal of expense and waste associated with uh, the rush to process all the voter registration applications that come in right before the book closing deadline. And if we use some of the technology that Reverend Hales was talking about, and if we have voter registration occur throughout the year, then and it being done automatically with the use of computerized systems and the use of databases that already exist, then we can expect uh, this to be a more efficient process. There's a great deal of content out there. There's a great deal of support. You can look on the Brennan Center website for some of this. Um, before, I, I'm almost out of time, but before I leave, I didn't want to suggest that the federal government is the only actor in all of this uh, effort to try and promote fair representation. Uh, localities can do a lot depending upon um, what their state constitutions say and what their uh, rules governing them say. And uh, I'm very excited to, to know that a couple of my panelists are going to be specifically talking about some of the efforts that some, uh, uh, that some of the states and localities are using, either in terms of uh, redistricting efforts or alternatives to single member districts such as choice voting and cumulative voting. Thank you so much, Manana. That was uh, very helpful. And, and um, we're going to move on now to our next speaker. Uh, John Greenbaum is the legal director and deputy director and director of the Voting Rights Project of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Is responsible for overseeing the committee's efforts to seek racial justice in the areas of employment discrimination, environmental justice, community development, and housing discrimination. Um, he also serves as the, as the director of the Voting Rights Project, where he's responsible for the Lawyers Committee program to achieve equality and protect advances. He's got many other things here under his bio. Uh, he's been doing this work for years in wearing different hats and uh, has made a tremendous contribution. Um, rather than going through it all because it would take up the rest of our panel to read it all, I will just turn it over to John to, uh, to enlighten us with his thoughts at this time. Thank you, John. Thanks. And uh, I want to thank, thank Rob uh, for putting this together and Fairvo for putting this together and asking uh, me to be on, on the panel. I want to thank everybody here for being so interested in the issue of voting rights and, and the case that was just decided. I'm going to spend about a minute most of my talk, I'm going to talk about what redistricting is likely to look like post-2010. I'm going to spend a couple minutes um, just addressing things that have been discussed before. First of all, with respect to voter registration modernization, Lawyers Committee is a strong supporter of the idea of modernizing the registration process and, and, and having people registered uh, by using existing governmental databases as opposed to the, the current system we have where you have to affirmatively register to vote. That, that will go a long way to, to solving some of the significant problems in our voting process. 
then going back to uh, the previous panel in the discussion of the mud case, uh, I want to disagree with, or I have a different view than than uh, Professor Persley on on whether this is a good result from our perspective. Uh, six months ago, nine months ago, a year ago, I would have taken the result that the Supreme Court came up with in this case. Not that I necessarily think it's the best result or what the court should have done, but uh, the reality is with the current su Supreme Court we have, any time we have a civil rights case go up to the court, I'm very skeptical as to how the court's going to come out. And generally they have not come out uh, in our favor in, 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 in the area of civil rights. So the result, while, while flawed and while strained in terms of its, its, its view of how the statute reads, is, is probably realistically the best we could expect. We should, we should be expecting at least one future challenge soon. One of my colleagues who's here, Marcia Johnson Blanco, was at the American Enterprise Institute a couple weeks ago. And uh, Michael Carvin, who uh, many people here know, who on the conservative side has argued some of the cases, including one that Steve Mulroy and I both worked on at DOJ, the Bozier Parish case, which I'll be talking about in a minute. Um, Carvin was sort of anticipating the Supreme Court uh, not striking down Section 5 because he was al already talking about how he was readying himself for the next challenge to the act. So we, we can see it. We can, it will probably come down the line soon. It may happen. The uh, state in Georgia, where the Department of Justice issued its most recent objection uh, to Georgia's voter verification procedures, which were basically citizenship checks and no-match checks that were extremely flawed. At least half the people that were alleged non-citizens, in fact, were citizens, and they weren't allowed, they wouldn't have been allowed to register to vote under what Georgia was, was trying to do. Um, uh, the Lawyers Committee, the ACLU, and MALDEF, when we found out about this last year during election protection, we filed what's called the Section 5 Enforcement Action to stop them from, into, uh, from implementing this plan. Uh, and we got a preliminary injunction. Georgia submitted the change for Section 5 preclearance. Uh, the department at the end of at the end of May issued a Section 5 objection. Uh, we have a status conference hearing in that case next week, and it'll be or actually this week. It'll be on Thursday. It'll be very interesting what Georgia says um, uh, during that status conference. At least in in one newspaper report, the Deputy Secretary of State there was talking about the fact that they're considering uh, bringing their case up up here to D.C. either as a combination pre-clearance and constitutional challenge, or maybe just as a constitutional challenge. So, uh, you know, we're, we're glad that, that, that we survived the first challenge, but we're, we're expecting many others, and we'll, we'll all be ready for it. So moving on, actually I spent way too much time on that, but <laughs> <laughs> moving on to what uh, post-2010 uh, redistricting is going to look like, you know, really assuming that that Section 5 is going to stay in place given the amount of time it takes to get one of these cases to the Supreme Court. The first, first thing is the Section 5 standard is going to be different in one significant respect from the last redistricting. And that is um, the case that I alluded to before, the Bossier Parish case. Uh, Section 5 prevents jurisdictions from implementing voting changes that have a discriminatory purpose or effect. The jurisdictions have to show that that purpose that that what they what they've what they're trying to implement doesn't have a discriminatory purpose and effect. For the first 35 years of the Act, discriminatory purpose meant anything with an unconstitutional, intentional, discriminatory purpose. In a case called Bossier Parish, the Supreme Court limited the meaning to of discriminatory purpose to only those purposes that were designed to make things worse off for minority voters. And uh, you know the significance of that is sometimes you have voting changes, for example, redistrictings that minority voters are no worse under the old plan as opposed to the new plan, but because of demographic changes and other changes, as a natural course of things, uh, minority voters would would should do better under a new plan. The, the famous example was from Georgia in the early 80s, um, where they didn't have any majority minority districts. And the head of the redistricting uh, committee 
down there said, I don't want to draw any N districts. And he didn't just use the word. He used the whole word there. Ended up in a, in a, in a uh, District of Columbia opinion that actually literally has a sentence, Joe Mack Wilson is a racist. So because uh, under, the, under the retrogressive purpose test, uh, that would not have been able to be objected under, under Section 5 basis because no African majority districts under the old plan, none under the new plan. The district that ended up having to be drawn as a result of this case in the 1980s was the district that John Lewis has represented for the last 20-something years. So that's going, to be, that's going to be a significant change. Other things to look for are going to be one minute, continuing changing racial demographics in terms of, and that, and that affects how redistricting is done and the degree to which there's racially polarized voting. And what that means in a practical sense is, you know, in the 80s, the test for, for when does a majority mi minority district become effective, it used to be 65%. Over time, that number has come further and further down. In a lot of cases, it's less than 50%. Now we have the recent Supreme, the other Supreme Court opinion involving voting this year, Bartlett versus Strickland, where the court said in order to have a district that is protected by Section 2, it has to be a majority minority in population. So you're going to have some places where you can draw a district of less than 50 percent and minorities are able to elect their candidate of choice, but those districts are no longer protected by Section 2 unless uh, Congress passes legislation to change that. Um, f really quickly, in terms of what the what the lawyers committees is going to be planning planning to do, is we're going to have a very active uh, redistricting program as well as bailout program. We're going to rely a lot. A, a lot of you in here either worked on or familiar with election protection. We're going to rely on the, uh, the election protection legal committees that we developed. Uh, through election protection, uh, we're going to work with whoever wants to work with us on the ground, the NAACP and, and lots of other groups in terms of providing legal support to communities that need it through the redistricting process. Thanks. Great, John. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to coming back to hearing more about that work during the Q&A. Um, for our next uh, panelist, I'm going to call on Dr. Michael McDonald. Uh, he's Associate Professor of Government and Politics at the George Mason University and also a Senior Fellow at uh, Brookings. Um, his research interests include voting behavior, redistricting Congress, American political development, and political met methodology. And uh, his voter turnout research has really, uh, in, in many ways, redefined how people think about voter turnout. It's not often that you can uh, do research that helps people think about things in a new way, but certainly he has been part of that. Um, he's also consulted to the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, consulted to the Pew Center for the States, has been an expert witness for election lawsuits in Florida and Washington, and a, again, another panelist whose resume goes on at length. Um, without going into great deal on that, detail on that, I'll just ask Professor McDonald to give us the benefit of his wisdom on these matters. Thank you. And I didn't graduate from Columbia Law School either. <laughs> at least uh, yeah, there's yeah, still time. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, I wanted to pick up something that uh, Nate Persley was talking about, and it's near and dear to my heart because it, uh, it's a chapter that I wrote for this book called The Future of the Voting Rights Act. Nate also contributed a chapter to this as well. And um, as people think about how we might be moving forward with the Voting Rights Act, I think that this is essential reading. Uh, so I highly encourage you to read it if you is haven't already book? read it. Is that new or this is uh, from the Russell Sage Foundation. It came out uh, uh, prior, well, the idea was to, to uh, put it out prior to the Voting Rights Act reauthorization, but then Congress kind of jumped the gun on us, and uh, so it came out uh, about the same time. So we re really missed our impact, as uh, we had hoped from this. Uh, we still tried to circulate some of the draft chapters uh, to members of Congress. Um, but still, if you're thinking about uh, how you reauthorize, uh, I would say, uh, or re revamp the Voting Rights Act, I'd say take a look at this book. Um, and the chapter that I wrote um, was uh, in some ways really uh, uh, set the, uh, the, um, much of the discussion in, in the Mudd case because uh, um, it's about the coverage formula and bailout. And I um, 
really speaking to Congress, but I guess also to the Supreme Court, um, looking at how outdated the coverage formula is. I mean, just on face value, it's very outdated uh, since it has 1968 elections uh, as uh, one of its, uh, and 64 elections as one of its uh, uh, participation triggering requirements. Um, so uh, uh, clearly, uh, if you just look at it as face value, um, it, the participation component of the um, coverage formula um, doesn't really seem to pass the smell test because if you update it, there, there's only one state in, that's entirely covered by the Voting Rights Act, and that would be Hawaii now. And that was using 2004 numbers. I hated to even think about uh, updating for the 2008 election because uh, turnout went up again in 2008. So we probably would have even fewer jurisdictions if we reapplied a new coverage formula um, and in place of the old coverage formula uh, that would actually be covered. Uh, so logically, some updating, and I understand that you know, there's other reasons why we we think that um, these jurisdictions uh, should be covered, be given the uh, level of participation uh, that was historic within these jurisdictions. So I don't want to diminish that at all. I'm just saying that politically, if you're thinking about revamping um, which states should be covered and which should not, which is something that Nate was uh, talking about, the political fights that would evolve from that um, sort of change to the coverage formula, um, you would bring in some states that aren't currently covered, some jurisdictions that aren't currently covered, you'd throw out a lot that are currently covered. I just don't think that that's feasible um, because the political battles would uh, array themselves such that Congress couldn't uh, uh, come to some sort of a compromise on that. So um, I discuss that in here. But, uh, but uh, I also discuss um, the fact that uh, uh, um, only at, when I wrote this, nine, but now 17 jurisdictions have successfully bailed out for, uh, from coverage under Section 5. And uh, I didn't, didn't see Jerry Hebert in the room, uh, but he's the bailout king since he's, uh, um, he has uh, represented all 17 of those jurisdictions that have successfully uh, bailed out. They're all local jurisdictions in Virginia um, out of some 880 or so jurisdictions. I, I have to relook at the numbers now, 17 minus 9. It's a little bit less than 880 now uh, that are currently covered. So um, uh, this, uh, when you look back at the reauthorizations of the Voting Rights Act in 82 and 75, um, this question of bailout was actually very central to the discussions that were uh, um, made in Congress. Amendments were uh, offered to restructure bailout. And in 82, you look at the testimony, uh, there was claims that 25 percent of the currently covered jurisdictions in 82 would um, bail out. 25 percent. Um, and we've only had 17 since 82. And that, you know this has been many, many years. So clearly, the expectations that were in the record in 1982 um, were not met by bailout. And I've I've talked with election administrators in some of these jurisdictions that are currently covered, uh, uh, that are covered jurisdictions, and I, I've asked them, I put it to them, well, why don't you bail out? Um, you, some of these people, um, Nate's mentioned like New Hampshire and, and some other places, clearly th they've been doing things without any objection from the Department of Justice. They have very low um, minority population, so it, it would make some sense that they would just go ahead and submit a bailout petition. And they say, well, you know what? We kind of know how to do this. We just submit the, the request, and it gets sent back to us in the Department of Justice, and we know how to do it. It's easy to do. Uh, why would we go through this more costly process of bailout uh, when we already have this sort of regime in place that's kind of marginally low cost to us, but uh, it's something we can live with. And this bailout may be um, relatively higher cost because it's not just whether or not your jurisdiction has had a Section 5 objection. Um, it's also that you have to prove that you've had some sort of proactive uh, um, actions to promote uh, uh, more fair elections within your jurisdictions. And so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a little bit more here than just simply uh, whether or not you've uh, had a, a Section 5 preclearance objection. And so maybe it's more costly. And so I really do, uh, I, I like Nate's suggestion uh, to uh, help out these jurisdictions. And in the chapter I wrote here, I mentioned that maybe we could reshape the Voting Rights Act because we were thinking about um, congressional action. Uh, 
such that the Department of Justice would take some sort of proactive steps to identify which jurisdictions would be eligible for bailout and help uh, those jurisdictions uh, escape from coverage. Uh, I like his idea of, of let's get a non-governmental solution, and, and uh, I think it would be wonderful if uh, we could have um, uh, um, wide involvement from the minority community on this, because uh, I think that would be a, a send a very good signal to Congress and the courts that um, we are serious about let's target this on those bad apples. And believe me, I grew up in Mississippi. I know that there are bad apples out there. I've lived uh, in a place where I had. Our family had a sheriff's car in front of us on the election in 84 because uh, we had death threats against our family. So I know that these uh, bad apples exist out there, but I, I, I would want to say well, let's get some of the good apples out of the, um, the bushel of bad apples. Um, one other thing um, I want to just briefly mention because, uh, um, um, uh, you know, what do we do kind of moving forward? And there's been a lot of discussion that Obama's election means that uh, we no longer need a Voting Rights Act because, uh, uh, look, we had an African-American president. <laughs> Success. Um, well, first of all, Iowa is not Alabama. So just because Obama won Iowa does not mean that um, things are all hunky-dory down in Alabama or Mississippi. So uh, I, I, clearly, if you look at the exit polls, if you look at um, some racial block voting analyses that have been done in the wake of the election, uh, there's still high levels of racially polarized voting in some of these jurisdictions in the 2008 presidential election. But let's even put that aside, because I don't even think the the 2008 presidential election is going to be our best test to determine whether or not there's racially polarized voting going on in a state legislative election or a city council election or bo county board of supervisors or whatever. And that's what the standard is in the courts as well. Uh, you look at endemic elections, uh, elections that are for the offices that you're looking at in terms of redistricting, and those are the most pertinent um, in terms of uh, whether or not there's the presence of racially polarized voting. And so those are the jurisdiction, those elections are the elections that we need to look at rather than to say, well, um, this presidential election proves that uh, um, everything's all fine in the United States. Thank you, Michael. Uh, for the next panel, so I'd like to ask Amy Nye uh, to address us. Amy is FairVotes Fellow on Representative Government, working on election system reform with a focus on systems of proportional representation. Uh, Amy also was uh, the research coordinator coordinator at IFAS, Democracy at Large, and she's worked as a co coordinator based in Reno, Nevada with the New Voters Project, which is a nationwide campaign focused on registering and engaging young voters. Amy, tell us how it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I would just like to say uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to this conference, and also that I really always appreciate uh, Jamie Raskin. Um, and Myrna and other folks being on panels um, with us and part of these events because it makes my job so much easier in talking about alternative voting systems. And I'm sure Steve will also uh, mention um, alternative voting systems a little bit in his uh, presentation as well. And as the title of, of this uh, panel implies, my focus today really is about um, talking about how we move forward in the current landscape towards improving uh, representation. And in, in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, choice voting, um, which can be a very effective remedy uh, for improving uh, representation and providing um, minorities a chance to elect a candidate of choice. And um, choice voting, as some of you might know, is an electoral system that is categorized as a form of proportional representation. Um, and it, it fundamentally, the principle of choice voting um, is it speaks to the heart of democracy itself because it is about majority rule, but it's also about minority representation. Uh, and choice voting, and I, I'm going to simplify how it works in one sentence, um, choice voting is based simply on individual voters' preferences, and the winners are determined through a process of surplus, uh, surplus transfers and eliminations in at-large elections. Um, and whenever I talk about choice voting, it always seems like a very foreign foreign concept. People think that um, I will be talking about how the European systems work, but actually in the U.S. we uh, have a very long history of how choice voting is work. Uh, 23 jurisdictions have used some form of proportional representation, choice voting in particular, to elect their uh, city councils here in the U.S. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about the, the history in some of these jurisdictions um, that really were effective in uh, allowing minorities to elect um, candidates of choice. Um, um, well, in, 
one of the jurisdictions that I, I would like to talk about is Cincinnati, uh, Ohio, which was one of the 23 uh, jurisdictions that first used um, proportional representation, choice voting in particular, to elect their city council. Um, in the U.S., the movement was really brought upon um, in the turn of the century as a good government reform measure to, you know, um, against the, the era of Tammany Hall and corrupt government. So um, the National Municipal League in, during the turn of the century really endorsed uh, choice voting as the method of um, improving local elections. So in Cincinnati, it was first implemented in uh, 1925, and it was very, very effective and helped to elect one of the first African Americans into city council there. Um, and it was uh, it continued to be effective not only for minorities, but also it helped to elect the uh, first um, um, a third party into city council as well. Um, and in, in this heydays, uh, choice voting helped to elect two African Americans um, in, in city council in Cincinnati, which was unheard of at that time um, in the 40s and 50s when you know, there was that uh, racial tension um, going on. Um, and in Cincinnati at, at that time, they were electing nine city council members, and they had, the African Americans had about 20% of the population. So it really illustrates the effectiveness of um, uh, choice voting in um, its ability of electing uh, uh, minorities in proportion to their share of the vote. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, in, in Cincinnati, um, it was uh, repealed uh, um, after um, you know, almost 11 elections. And it was repealed really because of the dynamics of its time um, and also because of the political era where the Republicans really felt like that they were losing those seats. Um, so they switched after five repeal attempts, they switched to an at-large winner-take-all electoral system, which then um, immediately after the switch um, Cincinnati lost all uh, minority representation and continue to do so for the next three elections. So that really emphasizes the, the effectiveness of how um, choice voting was being used at the time to um, get minorities into, into office. And then most recently, um, actually last year, uh, Fair Vote, um, in, um, working with the local NAACP, uh, went back to Cincinnati and tried to help them um, bring back proportional representation, which is what is, uh, choice voting is referred to locally there. Um, and uh, as some of you know, Cincinnati's in Ohio, and 2008 was a pretty, pretty big uh, election year for them. Um, so we came up to a number of different challenges, um, such as trying to get folks to read the last question, um, the last page of an eight-page um, ballot. <laughs> to talk about local elections when there was this huge national um, election and, and Ohio was its focus at the time. So uh, the fact that we even came 47% um, of, of the vote was actually quite miraculous uh, for us in Cincinnati. Um, but, you know, I, and there also other dynamics that were at play in Cincinnati, which was um, the, the incumbents were very much tied with the big businesses, so Macy's and Kroger's and other <laughs> types of uh, big business uh, big businesses were donating to the opposition. So I think that really was one of the main reasons why um, we we failed to achieve the 50% that was necessary to change the electoral systems um, in in Cincinnati. But in another um, city jurisdiction that has a history of choice voting that some of you might know but might be pretty surprising to others is New York City. Uh, New York City was um, one one of the uh, jurisdictions that uh, adopted uh, choice voting during the turn of the century. It used it very effectively for five um, consecutive elections. Um, between the 30, uh, 1936 and 1947. Um, and as like it was in Cincinnati, it was very effective in electing the first African American into um, city council. And um, likewise, it was probably a little bit too effective. It also um, elected a communist into um, city council at, at the time. And um, you know, after five consistent repeal attempts, um, it finally, um, the repeal was successful after um, New York City elected its first uh, African-American communist member into the city council. So it was just a little, a little too representative uh, for folks at the time. Um, 
But, you know, recently, I'm, I'll wrap up here. Uh, recently, uh, choice voting uh, was also used in the New York City school boards and was very effective in providing representation for um, minorities there, Latinos, African Americans, and Asians, and um, would have partly continued to be used there if not for the um, mayor mayoral takeover of the um, Board of Elections in, in New York City. Um, choice voting currently is used in... Um, Cambridge, Massachusetts has been successfully used for the past 50 years, and they have consistently been able to elect uh, minorities into the city council when they uh, have roughly about 20% of African Americans in Cambridge itself. And then this year is also uh, an interesting year for, for me, at least, in ga gathering more data, because in uh, Minneapolis, they will be having their first um, choice voting uh, elections for um, multi-member seats um, in, in, in November of this year. So I really do think that you know, as we're talking about um, you know methods for gaining fair representation, that choice voting can be such a vehicle in allowing um, jurisdictions to help um, candidates or help minorities elect a candidate of choice. Thank you, thank you, Amy, for giving us that uh, fascinating historical overview of choice voting, as well as uh, some, some of the battle scars of a hard-fought <laughs> campaign in Cincinnati. <laughs> Um, finally, for our final panelist, uh, with great pleasure, I introduce to you uh, Stephen Mulroy, um, who's an associate professor of law at the University of Memphis, and also uh, Steve is an elected office holder, a, a Shelby County Board of Commissioner. I've known Steve for a number of years, a, a, a fellow of uh, tremendous brilliance and always trying to think outside the box innovatively of how do we, how do we continue to uh, evolve as a democracy in the United States against the, the forces that would not only not like to evolve, but would like to turn the clock backward. Um, so Steve, we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to actually stand up and uh, use the podium because I'm a professor and I'm used to standing and professing. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> thank you, Stephen, for the introduction. And Rob, thank you to uh, New America Foundation and Fair Vote for organizing this conference and getting me out of uh, Memphis, which is very nice. Uh, any excuse to leave the heat and humidity of the Memphis streets for the heat and humidity of your overcrowded metros, I suppose. Um, but thank you anyway. Um, if, if I were to uh, try to uh, put, into, put my theme today into the uh, form of a haiku, <laughs> it might read, Supreme Court bears down, old methods under attack. We must find new ways. So it's a good thing I'm not going to put it into the form of a haiku, obviously. Um, but I do think there are some new ways that we should look at, and a lot of the panelists have talked about some of them. But the one that I want to focus on is the idea of using, getting away from a single-minded focus on single-member district remedies and looking at alternatives, non-district remedies, like cumulative voting, choice voting that Amy spoke about uh, so well a moment ago, and even limited voting as alternatives uh, to remedy minority vote dilution, both as a result of litigation and in other contexts as well. I think there are a number of reasons why voting rights advocates, defendant jurisdictions, and just people who are generally good government progressives who are interested in generic election reform might all prefer those types of remedies. Let me uh, unwind each one of those things. Voting rights advocates might prefer it because there, are my, there might be situations, and I think there you know, often are situations, in which alternative systems can actually do better for minor, minority voter empowerment than a single member district remedy. Sometimes you can only draw one district, but under cumulative voting or limited voting or choice voting, you can have more than one candidate of choice of the minority community uh, being elected. Or you can barely draw one district, but you can clearly elect one uh, minority candidate of choice using uh, one of these alternative systems. These systems also allow for automatic adjustment, if you will, if there are shifting demographics. If the minority population is increasing, then uh, you know, it, it can automatically adjust for that. And you don't have to wait till the decennial redistricting. Uh, it's also immune to Shaw or Miller uh, challenges. It's not a racial gerrymander. It's race neutral. And finally, it avoids any conflict between what we call symbolic representation and substantive representation. So you remember in Georgia in the 90s, they drew extra major majority minority uh, congressional districts, but that bleached surrounding districts. A lot of them turned very, very white and conservative and Republican, and you ended up having a state delegation that 
in the opinion of some anyway, um, ended up ideologically not representing minority viewpoints as well as it might have. Uh, I don't take a side on that debate. I simply say that non-district remedies get around that. They, they transcend that debate. Defendant jurisdictions may prefer it. Uh, again, you don't have to redistrict every 10 years, um, so you avoid all the litigation that usually comes with redistricting, like whether it's Shaw um, litigation or Section 2 uh, litigation or political gerrymandering litigation. Um, if the jurisdiction is small, then you avoid all the election administration hassle and expense of carving the district up into sub-districts and then having lots of different voting precincts. Um, and some people think that the at-large framework has its own advantages. You have representatives who have a district-wide perspective and not a parochial perspective. Finally, I think just good government reformers would uh, prefer it because it does, after all, as Amy explained, at least in the context of choice voting, but really in, in all these, it tends to lead to more proportional results. A 37% cohesive minority will get roughly 37% of the seats uh, and avoids a winner-take-all framework in which 51% of the voters control 100% of the power. Um, it also leads to diversity not only along racial and ethnic lines, but party lines, ideology lines, and gender lines. Women candidates do much better under these systems than they do under the uh, traditional uh, either winner-take-all at-large or single-member district framework. And they tend to lead to increased competition in elections, which therefore leads to higher turnout. So for these reasons, I think we ought to consider them as Section 2 of Voting Rights Act case remedies and just in general. Uh, in the late 90s, I wrote a couple of law review articles uh, trying to make that argument. Uh, the takeaway points from those basically are is we have this formula called the threshold of exclusion, which is universally acknowledged by people on all sides of this debate as being the way you predict whether you can have minority electoral success using one of these systems. That is something that we can rely on to predict whether these um, types of things will work for uh, Voting Rights Act cases. And assuming there's no state law problem and assuming that the defendant jurisdiction does not object, I would argue for a general preference for these remedies over districts for all the reasons I just mentioned. Now, am I saying we should never use districts? No, of course. There's a role for districts and there's a role for alternative systems. But in my opinion, the focus has been too much on the former, not enough on the latter. Um, why now? I think now is a particularly good time for considering these things. Um, because the options for single-member districts as remedies in Voting Rights Act cases have been narrowing. In the 90s, we saw them narrow because of the Shaw-Miller uh, uh, litigation, you know, the comments that uh, Professor Raskin was making earlier about the, the bogus uh, reverse discrimination suits. Um, Bartlett, the recent decision that uh, restricted the ability to um, push for so-called influence districts or opportunity coalition districts in which the minority percentage is less than 50 percent, that further restricts our remedial options using only a district framework. And we've just spent the entire conference almost talking about threats to uh, Section 5. So in, in, area, in an era when we're having these threats, we ought to be thinking outside the box, as Stephen Hill mentioned uh, earlier, and thinking more about these alternative remedies. There are two cases pending right now which raise that, I think, and exemplify this, uh, exactly this dynamic. One is a case that uh, Myrna and I have both been working on, the village of Portchester, New York. Uh, we have the mayor of the village of Portchester here. He's uh, a frequent attendant uh, at these uh, conferences, Dennis Pilla, uh, who is very interested in these things. And this is a case where you had a 2.4 square mile village um, that uh, you know, had a traditional dilutive winner-take-all at large system, was found to be in violation of Section 2, and they said rather than carve 2.4 square miles up into six different districts, let's use cumulative voting. Uh, the Department of Justice opposed that in a brief that I, I have to say, and I, I have friends here, I used to work there, uh, with all due respect, I thought that original brief uh, showed much too much hostility towards alternative systems, and it said that unless uh, you, uh, unless there were insurmountable obstacles to using districts, you couldn't even consider alternative remedies, a position which I think is, is not the law and ought not to be the law. Um, and so that's still pending. The other case uh, is in uh, Euclid, Ohio, the school board case. They uh, stipulated to Section 2 liability. They asked for uh, either cumulative voting or limited voting. Uh, once again, the Department of Justice opposed insisting on districts only. Although the brief contain, uh, did not contain any of that g general hostility towards districts, it actually was a, a much better brief. I was very heartened to read it. And I'm informed this morning that at oral argument, 
DOJ indicated some openness to the idea of limited voting as a remedy if the right number of seats were open. Anyway, uh, as was alluded to earlier today, uh, there was a, a district court decision that came out just yesterday that imposed limited voting as the remedy in a Section 2 case. And although I might quibble with certain aspects of the decision, the idea that we're open to these remedies, I think, is very heartening. So my, my basic point here is there's, a room, there's room for both these, but we ought to be focusing more on alternative districts. And I'll conclude by citing for that proposition no less a legal authority than Ogden Nash, who might have written, a veteran of redistricting fights said to those who'd enhance voting rights, don't be district contortional, just go PR proportional. Because that winner take all really bites. Thank you. I'm going to try to rhyme now for the rest of the uh, event. And, um, I thought we might try something just a little bit fun. Hopefully it'll be fun. Kind of a lightning rod um, where I'm going to ask a series of questions. Round. round. Thank you. I'm going to ask a series of questions, and you're going to be restricted to saying either yes or no. And, and maybe as we come back, uh, you can have 30 seconds to explain your yes or no if we have time. Um, so the first question, I mean, there was some discussion in the last panel, and we've sort of touched on it in this panel, whether, I mean, some people want their agenda to be sort of shoehorned into the Voting Rights Act and to expand the Voting Rights Act, and others are saying, no, leave the Voting Rights Act alone. If you try to do that, we may lose what we have there. So uh, this will be, a, the first one will be a two-parter. Should we expand the Voting Rights Act? Or should we pass um, new legislation, perhaps, and leave the Voting Rights Act alone, but pass a, a sort of a, the Voting Rights Act too, um, in order to encompass some of these other things that are left out of the Voting Rights Act now, but people seem to, um, to, to want to, to deal with. So first it will be expand the Voting Rights Act, yes or no. Myrna? I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you set up false dichotomies that I don't know say yes or no to. My, uh, Preserve the Voting Rights Act. I'm going to vote for preserving. The Voting Rights Act. <laughs> so that would, sorry, uh, exp going, how about expanding? You know, to co to put more so like voter registration to try and put uh, to deal with the lack of universal voter registration. No. To, no. Okay. So that is it clear what I mean? So expanding yeah. it to include things like universal voter registration and some of the other things, uh, choice voting, others. Should we expand it to include these sorts of things, or we'll come to the second part where should we just pass new legislation to deal with those? So. John Green based on that, based on those two, no to the first question, yes to the second. We'll get to the second. Okay, no. Expand Voting Rights Act. No expand, yes add. I'm a movie buff. I always prefer a sequel to a remake. <laughs> okay, Michael, expand Voting Rights Act. No, yes. I'm going to concur. <laughs> okay, and so we'll come yes. back. No, yes to, no, uh, yes. to yes. the sequel. Yes. The sequel. Okay. Yes, sequel. So, so we've got some common ground here. Pr <laughs> fairly good. Um, okay, so they... Um, Use of choice voting, cumulative voting, and some of these other methods, limited voting, um, Euclid and such, uh, should we be trying these, yes or no? Mayor, no. Yes, selectively. No, never. I hate all those alternative elections. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Michael? Yeah, yes, selectively. Amy? I need to preserve my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have some common ground there. Um, fourth, should women who arguably have are the most of the represented constituency in the country, with country being majority f female and uh, only 17% in the Congress. And if you look at the number of governors and you know, right on down the line, U.S. senators, it's, the numbers are actually quite appalling. So should women be included in the Voting Rights Act, yes or no? Mayor, no. No. John? Not, no, not in the Voting Rights Act. No, if you use alternative electoral systems, they'll be fine. <laughs> Michael? No. Amy? We don't need it with PR, so. Uh, should, we, should women be included in, um, in, a, in a sequel, Voting Rights Act 2, Myrna? No. no. Maybe. Maybe I'll do a maybe. A maybe? Yeah, maybe. No, same reason. Because you, you think that if we have, well, but we don't have proportional representation. But, but we're going to. After my speech, everyone's mind has been changed. So. In the DOJ, everyone's mind is going to have. Let's say we don't have proportional representation. Should we include it in, in the Voting Rights Act sequel? Um, I'm still leaning no, but I'm willing to be persuaded. So that's maybe a maybe. Mm -hmm. What's the question again? The question is, should women 
and the lack of representation be addressed through a Voting Rights Act sequel, Voting Rights Act 2? No. Amy? Maybe. <laughs> okay, so shaky common ground there. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that we'll, we'll end it there. We'll go to your questions. <laughs> I hope that was fun. It was fun. Great. There are some, uh, and some of you up against the uh, Erie River, predominantly white. South part of the city on the is black, sort of on the ends, and more white in the middle. With respect to the school board, I was of the view that if they would have gone to all five seats, being up at once, that limited voting where you would maybe vote for two, would actually be a preferred remedy to district voting. That there would be the opportunity probably to elect one and maybe to elect two members of the school board. The way the judge ordered it, it's going to be staggered where they're only going to have three seats up for the uh, no election in November this year and then two seats up two years from now. I have significant doubts that that African Americans will be able to elect their candidates of choice as either one of three candidates or one of two, based on you know my knowledge of the voting patterns. There it was one of the last investigations that I worked on before I, I, I left the Department of Justice. So I think it really sort of depends on the dynamics of the particular jurisdiction. One of the problems in Euclid is traditionally minority turnout has been low. In elections, and I think that I think that those are the sorts of places where um, alternative remedies, choice voting, are less likely to be successful. Is where you have have low turnout, as opposed to if you have a single member district that is predominantly minority, it's going to be very difficult to have a situation where, where minorities are not going to be able to elect their candidates of choice. Yeah, let me pick up on the participation differential. I think that's a, a big caveat I think we need to place on this, and differential eligibility um, uh, rates as well. We were just discussing uh, African Americans in some of these southern jurisdictions that are uh, ineligible to, to vote because of their felony status. Uh, they would be encompassed in a, dis a district if they are out in their communities, uh, but they would not be eligible to vote, and so they wouldn't have um, the representation if uh, they were subsumed into uh, some sort of uh, choice voting. Uh, and especially if you also look at Hispanics or Latinos, depending on which state you're in, um, again, not large non-citizen populations, uh, low participation rates, uh, I would be uh, a little hesitant to recommend choice voting in those circumstances. Also, though, I, I would say that in other circumstances, maybe, yes, we need to take a look here. Um, uh, one of the things that I really do not like about uh, majority-minority districts is that uh, they are a guarantee win for um, Democrats, typically, unless you're Cuban-Americans in Florida. And as a consequence of that, Republicans don't bother to run candidates in some of these districts. And there's no mobilization activities that are going on in those districts by the parties because there's no reason to have a local party structure in place. And so some of this differential part, um, participation rates are a consequence not of eligibility requirements but of the political dynamics that occur after you create these districts. And um, we need to have some active community organizing going on in these uh, uh, areas. And so if, um, if we can look at some other jurisdictions out there where maybe these eligibility uh, issues are not as paramount, um, I would say, yes, let's take a look and see if um, uh, choice voting can help uh, increase uh, at least some competition in those areas. Uh, Marina Perez. I just wanted to add, in addition to John's comment, it, it's not just the sort of structural issues like what the turnout looks like and what how many seats are going up at one time. I mean, not all of these alternative systems are the same. Uh, you know, choice voting is very good about not requiring the community to be um, as organized. Um, you know, there doesn't have to be one heir apparent as long as there is a couple of agreement or as long as there's a consistent agreement among the top one or two preferred candidates. Um, with cumulative voting and with limited voting, um, if you have two uh, candidates that have a contested claim to the community that you, uh, the contested claim for being the preferred candidate of the community that you care about, you can have a vote split and nobody gets anything. So um, I think the selectivity depends upon 
how many seats are up, what the turnout looks like, how organized a uh, uh, community is, and you know how much uh, the community can be disciplined into voting a certain way to allow the mathematical rules to work for them. And for that reason, I, I strongly support the use of choice voting um, as opposed to uh, the other ones. One, uh, one, of, uh, one of the things that I did that first uh, brought me into this world was I looked at the uh, the elections that had happened in Texas when um, they had, all, when so many of them had switched over to, to cumulative voting, and in many instances it, it worked when only one candidate of color ran. But uh, you know, when more than one ran, then it didn't look different than when there was a pure at-large system. So. Um, you know, given the fact that not all of these alternate systems are created equal, we need to be sensitive to what the community looks like, what they can accomplish, what the organizers look like, and uh, and, and and be judicious about what sort of remedy um, we're looking at. I just want to add one thing here too. It's just to turn the question on its head. Is you know the objections to the blanket imposition of single member districts. There are you know three three big considerations that you know when you can't create a majority minority district uh, to enfranchise the minority community, or if there are you know just under a fifty percent uh, minority, even though there's such a substantial you know over over forty percent minorities um, in a jurisdiction. And then lastly, there are you know tiny um, villages or jurisdictions like Port Chester that just don't want districts. They don't want to divide the community. And here in Greenbelt locally, that's a jurisdiction that was very um, much against you know dividing dividing their their um, city into districts. And I remember this one one line from. Um, a community event where a woman said, "You know, the roads in Greenbelt divide us enough. We don't need districts to like s separate our our community because we have do, we do have one cohesive interest." So those are some considerations to think about as well. That was Great. an argument made by many southern jurisdictions. Yeah, but there's a difference, though. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Saying there's Go ahead. But an argument. I, Go ahead. Well, sure. That argument was made by southern jurisdictions to continue traditional winner-take-all at large, dilutive. Um, systems which did not provide any opportunity for minorities to get elected candidates of choice. This argument is being made by a, a person who is um, not doing that, who is saying, let's try an alternative system which would provide just as much of an opportunity for minority voters to elect candidates of choice. I think the comparison is unfair. Um, one uh, observation I'll make, I'm from San Francisco where we use a ranked ballot method, instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting for single winner offices and um, the Board of Supervisors there, which is like the City Council, seven out of 11 of the members are minority. And um, you can see clear coalition building that goes on around the ranked ballots where different communities, uh, for example, previously the Asian community often would run with the, with the old uh, single member district system um, plurality vote. They would run a bunch of candidates and they would tend to cancel each other out and they had hardly any representation at all in San Francisco. But now with the ranked ballot method, you see Asian voters, even when the Asian, the leading Asian organizations and leading Chinese organizations split their endorsements for different Asian and Chinese candidates, the voters themselves figure it out quite clearly and they, they rank their Asian uh, and Chinese candidates in a way that allows the, the ones that have the most support to be the beneficiary of that coalition building. So it's, it's really quite interesting to see these different methods in action and really see how, you know, beyond the theory and all these sorts of things, how they actually work in practice. So next question. Where are we? Hi, I'm Rose, and I've worked on um, some campaigns and on voter protection programs in the past. And one of my concerns about the um, voter registration uh, modernization is that when we've seen governments being forced to take on the role of voter registration proactively, like with motor voter laws and things like that, we've had a lot of concern with it and a lot of people who haven't gotten registered and everything. And I know that it might be better than the current system, but I still have some practical concerns about how that could be implemented and whether the government and the governmental systems would respond appropriately and take on that role well. Who wants to take I'll, I'll take it. And maybe, John, if you, if you seem appro think it's appropriate, mm -hmm. maybe comment on some of the other efforts that are under, go, uh, going on out there, for example, trying to lower the voter registration age to 16 and enact universal voter registration. There's a mm -hmm. host of approaches that are mm -hmm. being tried, and maybe you'll have some thoughts on that. Okay. Um, 
You're right that with respect to NVRA, that this, that the implementation has been spotty over time, and you know that's one of the reasons why Project Vote, Demos, and the Lawyers Committee, we've been litigating some of the lack of of compliance for motor voter public assistance agencies. Um, two two things with respect to why how we would deal with the problem with jurisdictions not complying with with the automatic permanent system. First thing is, one of the components of it that we're talking about would be an election day correction aspect, so that if you showed up at the polls and you weren't on the list, you'd be able to register and vote on election day. Second is, there have been, there have been substantial efforts made to try to get election officials at least some election officials behind what we're talking about here. And a lot of them see the advantages of having this type of system because among other things, the way it works now is you get a flood of registration applications that come in right at the deadline, right when they're busy getting ready to prepare for the elections themselves. They have to hire a whole bunch of people, temporary people, less trained, more liable to make mistakes, and it's a huge load. It's a huge load on the system. I, I looked at the figures in Ohio in 2004, and it was several million dollars that jurisdictions spent just hiring temporary people before before the election. You have a situation. You have a situation where you have the automatic permanent election day correction system. You're not going to have that. You're not going to have that huge demand occurring at the end. So there, there are a lot of election officials that are actually um, enthusiastic about this. I mean, of course, they're concerned about the cost issues, and Munich can maybe talk about that, that and, and other things some more. But so the, those are things that we've thought about in, in terms of this whole concept. Myrna. No, I mean, I just wanted to mainly say that a lot of uh, a lot of this is like a, a you know a drafting issue. I mean, you didn't sort of specify what your particular concerns were, but um, you know the there's a lot of people working on this issue. There's a broad coalition uh, that includes a lot more people than just uh, you know the leadership conference and uh, you know the lawyers committee and the Brennan Center and a number of other people in this group. And um, as these concerns come out, you know people are going to be thinking about ways to fix them. I think um, you know. John, uh, you know, did a good job of highlighting sort of the election day correction, which is, you know, what happens when people are, uh, you know, somehow missed off the uh, missed off the rolls. But also, uh, this rush of ballots or uh, these rush of applications coming in at the last minute mean that people typing them in make mistakes, and so you have people that are, you know, either can't match because there was some sort of typo put in when they were being entered, or you know, their name doesn't appear the way that it does on the poll book, and they have a problem on election day. So, um, you know, our current system has a, a great deal of, of you know, problems inherent in the system and, you know, this is one of those reforms that, you know, we hope will get at a lot of the people that aren't participating. Um, Michael McDonald did this great uh, report on the states that already have some sort of what we would call like portable or permanent registration, which is, you know, states that have taken the time to uh, track people as they move and make sure that their registration follows with them or has some sort of uh, method on on that way. Um, I recently released a report a couple of weeks ago that you can find on the Brennan Center website that talks about like what happens when people move and they don't update their registration rules. Um, you know, on election day, it's basically pandemonium. Like it depends, you your ability to vote depends upon you know where you live and uh, whether or not the election officials know the rules, whether or not you know the rules, and um, whether uh, whether or not you have the sort of gumption and time to sort of you know you know, push yourself, you know, through a process that's not um, as effective or as easy for voters. And, you know, we, we need a better way. And, Marinette, the Brennan Center, I know, has is, is started to really do a lot of work around um, universal voter registration or voter modernization, as it's being called now. And I know that um, uh, my organization, we've been, we've had two bills in California, one to lower the voter registration age to 16, another to, um, to enact what we call automatic voter registration. When someone goes to the DMV or someone goes and, and pays their taxes, instead of being offered the option to vote, they're just automatically registered. Um, and so it's making an opt-out system, in other words, instead of an opt-in system. 
And uh, I know Fair Vote has been doing some of these sorts of things in Florida. The Republicans in Florida, Charlie Crist as governor, passed lowering the voter registration age to 16. So uh, any thoughts on, on these sorts of efforts, new tools in the toolbox of democracy to bring more people on board? The good, bad, uh, your thoughts? Well, states currently have obligations to do automatic updates from the DMV, right? So states currently under the NBRA um, are supposed to be uh, engaging people with the system at public assistance agencies. And as John mentioned, there are a lot of very good people doing litigation when they're not when they're not complying with this. Um, you know, a voter registration modernization plan would need to include some sort of way of capturing as many people as we can, which means, you know, going to the public agencies, uh, you know, making sure the DMVs are adhering to, uh, you know, their policies for incorporating people, going to the schools and having people uh, be on track to be registered as soon as they turn 18, um, and uh, making sure that election officials have the capacity to uh, to bring every eligible American in, into the process. And so I think all of these reforms that sort of promote that are, are reforms worth talking about and are, are being, um, you know, considered as part of a package to uh, to register every eligible American. And Michael McDonald, how about lowering the voter registration age to 16? Yeah, um, so a couple things. Thanks, Mira, for the shout out uh, about the portable registration. And I just say that there's, states are actually doing a lot of this election day correction, election day registration. Uh, statewide portable registration. Uh, I see statewide portable registration as an easy fix to the NVR NVRA because um, we already allow it at the local jurisdiction level, so why not just expand to the state, uh, especially now that we have uh, HAVA and statewide um, voter registration databases. It's a simple thing to do. And uh, the new NVRA report that uh, will be issued from the EAC to the um, uh, Congress soon will show over 60 million registrations were uh, um, transferred. I mean, transferring your address. So uh, it's a big burden on election administrators, uh, and, it, uh, and it makes a lot of sense to help participation because it does increase turnout uh, for those people who move. So I think it's a good way to go. On the pre-registration, I've been doing a report for Pew, uh, a study for Pew, I should say, and that study will be coming out shortly. And uh, uh, I've been looking at the Hawaii and Florida um, uh, programs. And I, I just want to say one thing about this, which is that just put enacting Registration for 16-year-olds will not be sufficient, all right? So just saying, hoping that people will register at their DMV offices when they're 16, when there's no linkage between that act of registering and their vote, intention to vote, will not increase registrations among young people. What does work and what Florida and Hawaii do is they have uh, programs to go into the schools and do uh, pre-registration within those schools. It's part of a comprehensive program of civic education, pre-registration, and of um, recruiting student poll workers. Uh, and that, as a, I think that's what really what we need to do. The thing about Hawaii and Florida is that this is not um, state mandated, mandated, I should say, on the educator side. It's ed uh, mandated on the admi election administrator side. And so where we get friction is where um, election uh, the school administrators don't want to participate in these programs. So any sort of um, sort pre-registration program I think needs to be coupled with a civic education component that um, also puts a little bit of participation onus upon uh, the school administrators as well. Amy or Steve, you want to jump into this? I was just going to uh, do a plug for Adam Fogel, who is our Right to Vote Director. That at Fair Vote, we do have a learning democracy program that does work with the schools in our community. Um, to get them engaged. So I think it's definitely you know, very effective in uh, getting students when they're young and it kind of it couples with the legislation of trying to get them registered when they're young. Because civics education is really is key um, to getting, getting youth voting and being a part of the process. Great. Any other questions? Any questions so Steve, I, I wanted to throw out one, one question. I know we need to let, to, uh, let people go. This is Rob. But, um, so we're looking at, at the U.S. Senate, and, and, and the U.S. Senate, we're not going to get a, a, a proportional voting system, choice voting, anytime soon. Um, and, um, and some redistricting there, and too. And there it? is... Uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, breaking up Texas into six states. Um, is, um, Barack Obama was elevated to the White House, and, and so there's no elected African-American in the U.S. Senate, and the appointed African-American probably has a tough re-election next year, uh, or re reappointment or whatever you <laughs> um, And uh, there's also very likely going to be a drop in Latino representation in the U.S. Senate uh, next year unless there's a uh, Latino who wins elsewhere. So we may have a U.S. Senate in 2011 that has no African Americans um, and has you know, two Latinos, I think. Um, and 
when we look at women, they're sort of stalled, generally 16, 17 percent of both the House and the Senate. And part of it to me is naming, naming the problem and being able to have a frank discussion about it. And I thought it was interesting when there was appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court with Sotomayor, it was pretty directly acknowledged, there's going to be a woman appointed. Mm -hmm. And she's the third appointee ever, and there should be the second on the court with seven men, uh, if uh, she is uh, confirmed. Um, and I hope they don't stop, that they're not done with women. But, but that um, there, there was a recognition that that was a good thing, but we seem to have a problem of having that conversation when we talk about politics and representation and political actors seeking women and people of color to run. And do you see that as, as something that can be affected by policy, or is this something that just is a different discussion that needs to happen, and can it happen in the United States, given the, the difficulty it seems to be to, to name the problem that way? Was it me, Steve, or you, Steve? Oh, I think it was to, not to me, to you. That's uh, a, it's a really good question, and um, I'd welcome comments from other panelists on it, because I'm not sure I have the a magic bullet answer, but it is a really odd thing, because you would think, if anything, it's, it's more legitimate to talk about having symbolic representation to having a certain number of women or African Americans or Hispanics in a representative policymaking body like the U.S. Senate than it would be on the U.S. Supreme Court, where it's supposed to be, or at least some people claim that it's all supposed to be, you know, umpires calling balls and strikes, and it's all, you know, following the law without any uh, discretion for policy. At least some people say that. And so why we have that, um, I don't know. I think that, um, I mean, I don't want to, you know, ride a hobby horse, but I, I think a certain part of it is that the electoral mechanisms we have in place, you know, aren't, don't really have that many opportunities, particularly for, for, for women. Um, but how we use policy or, or change the conversation to, to be more open to that, I, I really don't have an answer. It's a good question. Other panels, thoughts, comments? All I could say is we have a Rube Goldberg machine that's called an electoral system in the United States, and there are many levers and moving parts. And I, I agree that there's just not going to be one single magic bullet that's going to solve this. Uh, we're going to have to look at the whole system as a comprehensive whole. We'll have to look at the might role of money in elections, um, uh, the role of incumbency, uh, the role of the, the districts, uh, many different things. And then the re party recruiting efforts and, uh, and what's going on. Uh, with the parties and the campaigns to have a better understanding of what's going on. But I always challenge my students to say, look, 54 percent of, um, of the electorate was women in the 2008 election. Where's our woman president? I mean, so it's clearly, you know, women are voting. They vote at much higher rates, but for some reason they're not um, selecting uh, women candidates. And so we need to figure out why there aren't more women candidates out there and, and, and what the barriers are to um, more fully understand what's going on here. One other yeah, quick comment. I, I, you know, when you do the research on the different electoral systems, one thing that I, you do come across is that uh, when they say, well, why, you know, do these alternative systems tend to elect uh, more women than winner-take-all systems? And there seems to be, at least one theory is, that when you've got to put all your chits on one candidate, then there's this, the natural sexism of some voters anyway, this traditional notion of the leader being, you know, a patriarchal figure. That tends to be more of the psychological dynamic. But when you can vote for three candidates at once, then there's more of an openness to saying, well, all right, I'll make sure that one of them is, is, is a female. Um, and that might explain why you have that, that significant difference in um, female candidate electoral success in the alternative systems. Well, one interesting observation on that would be a country like Germany, for example, which actually has uh, two systems that operate side by side. One, single member districts where voters are voting for their district representative, and then a proportional representation system. And you can see in Germany that women win about 13, 14 percent of the seats in the single member districts, about what we win in the United States. And in the proportional system, they're winning 39, 40, 40, up, sometimes up as high as 45 percent. Um, and, and part because they have teams of candidates, and they even do things like they rotate on their list, man, woman, man, woman, man, woman. So there are different systemic reasons why women are winning 44% of the seats in places like Sweden and Germany and other places that we don't, uh, we can't, we don't seem to, to see here. And I just wanted to comment, and maybe, it, you know, being a woman of color, this is very obvious to me. I think... Um, Identity politics is hard. It's hard on a personal level. And when people have to make one choice, like do I identify because of my 
race? Do I identify because of my gender? Do I identify because of uh, my, uh, you know, educational background? Do I identify because of my geographic location? You know, you have a lot of different sort of confluences uh, coming into play and a lot of conflicts. But on a, on a system where you're allowed to rank and you don't necessarily have to pick one sort of aspect of your identity among the others, it makes people much more comfortable with, uh, you know, making choices and that would allow all the very different complex facets of their personalities to be uh, represented and depending on how the other voters feel, the candidate most viable among the ones that you feel some sort of affinity to are going to be selected. And I just want to add that the issue of opportunity is also something to consider for the Senate. That you know, when you have when you have incumbents that are in there for years and years and years and whatnot, that you know, I'm not necessarily you know proposing it, but I, I think that you know maybe term limits or something like that should be at least consider or even part of the the dialogue. Because if there when there is no opportunity when you are going against an incumbent that's been in the office for you know however many years in terms and with you know monetary support, it's it's very very difficult to be a challenger and try to be part of the, the process. And then likewise, another thing that we could potentially talk about is even um, instant round of voting, uh, another ranking system for single member seats, which I think would definitely help um, in, in the issue of representation. Great. Any final thoughts, comments? Can we call it a day? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the panels. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. And stay tuned for the next uh, panel we'll have probably at the end of the summer on other issues having to do with representation.